Good evening, everybody. I am Roy Epstein, chair of the Belmont Select Board. Um, this evening's meeting is a discussion of the article on the warrant for the special town meeting in a couple of weeks regarding <clears throat> a withdrawal of Belmont from civil service. And since this topic probably is unfamiliar to a good many um, town meeting members, we thought we would have this session to uh, present the, the, the reasons for this article, the thought process behind uh, the select board, town administrator, and the uh, police and fire chiefs, <clears throat> and to take uh, questions both from town meeting members and because it's a public meeting, I imagine there could well be not just members of the public, but union members as well. And we look forward to questions and uh, uh, particularly from union members about their concerns about this article. Uh, the speakers tonight, in, in addition to myself, I'll act as moderator. Uh, we have Patrice Garvin, town administrator, uh, John Marshall, assistant town administrator, uh, Chief McIsaac of the police department, uh, just Porter of HR, um, assistant chief uh, Hurley from the police department and acting fire chief Wayne Haley. Um, I'm gonna make some very brief introductory remarks. Uh, Patrice is going to uh, show a, a brief uh, PowerPoint deck. And then we're going to be joined by uh, two union reps, Corey Taylor and Ross Vona, and then we'll open it up for questions. So let me just talk for a minute about why the select board uh, wanted to put this article on the warrant. Um, and the, the bottom line from the select board's point of view is that uh, we think that leaving civil service will make Belmont government, particularly the police and fire departments, more efficient and will serve the taxpayers better. Uh, in order to leave civil service uh, legally, uh, that can only be done by a vote of town meeting. And that's why the article is on the warrant. Um, civil service has been the subject, sorry. Um, civil service has been the discussion, uh, the subject of a fair amount of discussion in many towns and also at the state level. I can tell you that a good number of towns similar to Belmont have already left civil service. They've gone through a similar process. They include Wellesley, Westwood, Marlboro, Lexington, Sudbury, Wayland, and the, there's a list of others as well. Uh, Belmont joined civil service in 1915, That's, so it's more than 100 years ago, and that, that was before police and fire unions existed, or certainly before they existed in Belmont. Uh, regardless of the reason for uh, joining civil service at that time, uh, the system, in our, our view, really has become archaic and, and inefficient. You know, hiring and promotions take too long. Uh, they're cost, unnecessarily costly, and we're not able to always attract the best candidates. Uh, the police and fire chiefs and the town administrator will get into the details of why Belmont uh, will be better off if the system is a little bit involved. Uh, the select board has been considering, since I've been on the select board, we've been considering leaving civil service since at least last fall. Uh, both finalists for police chief last January recommended leaving civil service. And I, I wanna add that leaving civil service and the thought process that brought us here is not in any way connected to Black Lives Matter or any other current debates over policing. This is something that originated as a purely local uh, consideration or local concern. I wanna assure everybody that employees uh, police and fire employees will continue to be treated fairly. Current employees, and this may not be widely appreciated, all current employees under civil service will continue to enjoy civil service status. They will be grandfathered even if Belmont withdraws. Uh, and secondly, the collective bargaining agreements that are in place now will remain in place if we leave civil service. Uh, the select board is committed to making Belmont government as efficient as we can before asking for an override. And leaving civil service for me is part of that commitment to the voters. 
Uh, and with that, I would like to turn it over to Patrice for the presentation, and then we'll take uh, questions from the audience. Great, thank you, Roy. Um, as Roy said, my name is Patrice Garvin. I'm the town administrator in Belmont. We're going to show you a brief presentation and then open it up for questions. So what is civil service? Civil service was created in 1884 by the state, uh, primar primarily to protect hiring and discipline from patronage and political interference. Belmont adopted civil service um, at their annual town meeting in 1915. And this was well before unions existed and well before collective bargaining agreements existed. So who is covered under civil service? Currently, civil service includes only the Belmont police, patrol and supervisors, and Belmont firefighters. Um, I will add that the current police chief, fire chief, acting police chief, and acting fire chief do not um, fall under civil service. Employees currently covered under civil service will remain in civil service. They'll be grandfathered, grandfathered in, even if town meeting votes to leave civil service. So the process to leave, Belmont entered civil service as we stated in 1915 by a town meeting vote. And now town meeting would need to vote to leave. And that is the article on the warrant um, for the September town meeting. Why is it better for Belmont to leave civil service? Civil service is very costly for Belmont. Um, there are long vacancies that can occur within the um, civil service system because it's archaic and bureaucratic. Also modern collective bargaining agreements and comprehensive policies are in place now and they work much better than the civil service process. There's a limit to the applicant pool and this has a direct impact on the diversity of the candidates that we um, can hire. It is hard to hire the most desirable applicant when you have to deal with the civil service uh, requirements. So there's an inefficient hiring and promotion, promotional process as well. How will employees be protected if Belmont leaves? Current employees would retain their civil service status, which provides the right to appeal decisions, discipline in civil service through the, in the civil service commission or through an arbitrator. Also collective bargaining agreements address the di disciplinary process, including termination and usually require just cause for termination. What does civil service do? Civil service offers standardized tests of new applicants and employees seeking promotion. Test results go on a hiring list ordered from high to low. Also, it handles the appeals for employees who have been disciplined or bypassed for a promotion and simply for applicants who have been bypassed for employment as a new hire. <clears throat> so who is on the civil service list? This year, the town of Belmont only had nine people from Belmont pass the police civil service test. This is not enough to meet our needs, especially um, when we're looking to diverse, diversify the police department. Civil service no longer allows minority and female only lists to be uh, chosen from. <clears throat> civil service has preferences within the hiring process. Absolute preference relative to placement on the list is given to disabled veterans, veterans, and children of deceased or just severely injured officers. Bypass of a candidate being less qualified for the position is possible, but it is difficult and lengthy process. There are requirements to take the test. Under the current civil service system, the minimum entrance and promotional standard are a high school diploma or a GED and a valid Massachusetts, Massachusetts driver's license. There's also an age requirement. There are a minimum age of 19 and a maximum age of 31. Requirements to qualify the, for the entrance exam. Recently, we had one of these examples where we had a, a qualified good candidate to take the test, but unfortunately their maximum age was over 31. So these requirements for the test does not consider other criteria considered most important for Belmont. I'm going to have Acting Chief Wayne Haley discuss some of the fire challenges in being um, remaining in civil service. Wayne. Can we- Good evening. 
Um, so some of the challenges with the fire department are um, different than the police. So when uh, we are hiring, we hire paramedics. Um, we have a paramedic preference because we run an advanced life support ambulance. So when we ask for candidates from civil service, we get a list of up to 250 names. Um, <clears throat> that does not mean that 250 people are gonna walk through the door looking to come to work in Belmont. Um, surprisingly, it's, it's much smaller and it's usually just a handful. We'll be lucky if we're hiring one that we get three that come walking through the door. And the reason I think for that is that um, they have so many choices as paramedics and where to work. Um, so they may be shopping around and we're competing with um, all the other um, civil service fire departments that are um, hiring paramedics. Um, sometimes that gets competitive and we lose a um, participant midway through the process that we would have liked to have hired, but they went somewhere else. Um, so it gets very competitive. Um, in, you know, if you're dealing with 250 candidates and uh, the 250th person walks in the door, that may not be the best hire for Belmont. Um, we, would, we would like to see people that may not be 250th scorers on the list. Um, but we are required to hire um, or, or bypass. And a bypass requires uh, quite a bit of work, as was stated in the slide, um, up to 10 pages. Uh, I've seen Chief Frizzell do to bypass somebody to justify their reasons for the, the bypass. And that um, can hurt them in, for future hiring because you really have to, unfortunately, really uh, assassinate their character to, um, to bypass them. It, there has to be good reasons. So, um, you know, those aren't the people we're looking to hire. So, um, In addition to that, um, layoffs back about, I'd say 15, 16 years ago, we had to hire four people from Lynn that were laid off. We made a brief investment in them. They were here for about a month, um, bought them turnout gear and all kinds of uh, equipment, getting them hired and all that. And three of them left immediately as soon as they got the option to go back, uh, one stayed. So, um, you know, I'd say more often than not, people that are laid off go back to the community that they originally came from. So I can answer more questions later. I think we should move on though. So Jamie, could you speak to the police challenges in remaining in civil service? So we, we've, um, civil service has been a challenge for us for, for a number of years, um, you know, and for us, the main focus is the hiring process. It's just uh, very tough for us to get enough people in Belmont to take the exam. Um, I just wanted to go over one more time. In order to get on the list, you have to reside within the community of Belmont for one year prior to, prior to taking the exam. You have to take the exam, which is given um, every two years. And then you have to um, <clears throat> hope that you, you, know, you score in the top and that nobody with an absolute preference is ahead of you. And I can give you some examples. In 2012, we had five vacancies. Um, we spent $331,620 in overtime that year. In 2013, we had four vacancies for the year. We spent $373,570 in overtime that year because it takes, that, it takes that long to fill those positions. Fast forward now, four years later, including pay raises and step raises, 2017, first time in a long time, we're fully staffed. We spent $278,000 in overtime. So generally, you know, you go back four years, we're spending between 90 and $100,000 in overtime to fill just basically four or three positions um, within the patrol positions, very costly to do that. Um, during, in, in to give an idea about candidate history, in, in, in May of 2016, we sent out a notice that we wanted to hire. Seven people got a card in the mail saying the Belmont police are hiring, come down and, and sign the list. We had only three people come into the station to sign the list that they wanted to be a police officer in Belmont. 
month later, because you have to wait a number of times, you have the list has to be there. We sent it out again. We sent out 10 cards. This time an additional three people came in uh, to sign the list. And we had enough candidates now to move forward. We had six. And uh, same thing happened in, in uh, 2018. We, had, we sent out 13 cards to individuals. Seven came in to sign. Um, this is uh, the, the situation Patrice was talking about earlier. We had a candidate that was by far the best candidate. Um, he offered somebody that would have offered some diversity to our department. Uh, Chief McLaughlin and I you know, said, wow, this, this is really a good candidate. It's a good opportunity. And we found out that he had been six months too old when he took the, the entrance exam for civil service. So we were not able to offer him a, a position within the department. This year, we're looking at uh, three to possibly four vacancies in the department, and we have nine people on the list. I don't know of any other organization that wants to be successful that would hire uh, candidates for a job is, is so important as being a police officer um, with, with nine candidates. Belmont just does not provide the opportunity um, for us to, to select. When I got hired back in, in 1999, um, I think there was probably 50 plus people on the list at that time. Those days are gone here in Belmont. And, um, you know, you, you talk about the absolute preference. I don't, uh, I think veterans should get preferences and I think they should get them. Uh, if we move out of civil service, I think in, in our entrance exam, we should give points to veterans. However, uh, what we run into, and there's not a lot of veterans on the Belmont list, but other communities that have driven them out, you can have a candidate who's uh, academy trained, they have a college degree, they have a work, solid work history, and um, they get 100 on the, the, so the civil service exam. And in front of him or her is uh, six veterans that all got 70 on the exam. That absolute, that's just not fair. That's not fair to the person who's, uh, you know, who's clearly the, maybe the better candidate. And so, you know, the time has come. It's, it's time for us uh, to get out of civil service. I have people call me all the time. I've told this story. We had, uh, had a young woman from Fitchburg State. She was graduating this year. Fitchburg State has a great program where you, you get a degree in criminal justice and, and you, you're academy trained. She called. She said, I want to know. I heard that you might have openings in Belmont. And I said, you know what? You're going to have to, um, you're going to, have to move to Belmont, live here for a year. And next April, take the exam and, and, and hope that you get uh, a good score and that, you know, we could take a look at you. And, um, you know, and as far as the, the diversity aspect of it goes, uh, which is really uh, bothers me is some of the things I've heard, because, um, you know, you cannot hire, uh, you cannot create uh, all minority lists or all female lists. Those days are gone. And, you know, for the Belmont Police Department came up with Bill uh, 1474 that is making its way through the, the House of Representatives, actually the Senate right now, that would allow um, people who graduated from Belmont High School to receive the same preference that residents in Belmont got. The Mass Chiefs got behind that. And we're the only community, the civil service community, in all the years that civil service has been around that made an attempt to, to diversify the department um, through those methods. So we've been actively proactive in trying to diversify the Belmont Police Department. But as I've said in my interview process, diversifying the department's only one problem we have. Finding candidates is a big problem that we have. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's time uh, for us to, to move out of civil service. Lexington just moved out of civil service. They gave an exam last month. They had 220 people take the exam. They had 157 pass and they put 64 through their physical abilities test. And this is the, this is the great thing about it. You know, those nine people, if I put all of them in the process, half of them might fail the PAT test. And then we have to start the process all over again. Very time consuming, waste a lot of money, very inefficient way to run an operation like a police department or a fire department. But most importantly, any organization is gonna tell you, any organization that strives to be successful or wants to develop, develop high quality service products is gonna tell you, you do that at the hiring level. You hire good people, you hire the right people and, and, and you develop success uh, one step at a time. And this is the most important step. It's the process when we bring somebody in, you bring in the wrong person, they end up costing you down the road. 
they create vacancies, all sorts of uh, not good things can happen. Great, thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Wayne. So benefits of removal. We're able to set our own minimum eligibility criteria and have a more diverse pool of candidates. For example, residency, age, military experience, certification, whether it be EMT or paramedic, language proficiency, ac academy training. These are all things that the town would be able to use as a, as a tool to um, attract candidates to the town. We would open the door for more candidates with significant and varied life and career experiences. We'd be able to have um, applicants have some type of work experience, education experience that we determined um, to be the best for the town of Belmont. Other benefits include a town specific testing and assessment process could be developed using department specific criteria. And this criteria could change as the, the, the um, policing changes or the fire department changes. By developing its own entrance and promotional exams, Belmont would also receive test results within a matter of days versus months it takes with civil service. Um, we're told that with civil service, it takes about four months to get test results back. Again, that's more time and that's more um, accumulation of costs that the town incurs waiting for um, vacancies to be filled. Promotional processes can be more accurately determined, suitably, suitability for promotion. Attributes beyond a multiple choice test score, such as work product, community contributions, performance evaluations would factor into promotion. A probationary period could be instituted for promotion. For hiring and promotions, individuals may already be academy trained or paramedic certified. This is also a cost to the town. We hire candidates to fill vacancies. If there is an academy that is close to when we hire them, we would be able to put them and enroll them into the academy. Otherwise, we would have to wait for the academy to have a space available. That's again, money that we would have to pay while we're waiting for a spot to open up into the academy. And then we pay them while they're in, a, in the academy at, at their salary. Leaving civil service would give us the opportunity to possibly hire people that are already academy trained. The process could include other components to help assess the candidate's knowledge, strength, and abilities. Promotions would also focus such, would also, would also allow factors such as job-related experience, attendance record, education, career development, disciplinary record, attitude, work ethic, and initiative to be considered. So this concludes our presentation. Um, as Roy indicated earlier, we are going to um, welcome two union members as panelists, and then we're going to take questions from the public. So John, if you could promote Corey and Ross. Um, one other thing before we, we start to take questions, I just want to thank everyone on the panel for all their hard work this week in uh, developing this presentation, and I look forward to a he healthy debate at town meeting. Okay, thank you, Patrice. Yep. Uh, thank you, everybody. We are now open for questions, so please raise your Zoom hand if you'd like to ask a question, and we'll... Uh, take you in the order that I see you. First hand up is Jesse Bennett. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks, Roy. Um, Jesse Bennett, town meeting member of Precinct 1. Um, I'm curious about the question about the upper age limit. Um, and this is, you know, coming up to speed on what civil service does for us. Um, there are about 20, it, by my count on the um, state website, there are 26 communities that are under the same upper age limit limitation as Belmont, um, but there are like 85 that don't have any upper age limit. Um, so I, I just wanted somebody to speak to that because I'm, I'm not sure why we have one set of requirements when a lot of other towns have another. Mm -hmm. You can take that question away. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. So, hi, Jesse. How are you? Good. How are you, Jamie? 
Good. Um, so I, I want to guess it was probably about 2003. Uh, I wish not, nothing at you, Wayne, but I wish Chief Fazell was here because he would remember it. Chief Osterhaus from the fire department proposed this at town meeting. And the reason he proposed it, we had an individual who was, I think he was 63 years old and he was trying to get on the fire department. And they had bypassed him a couple of times and he had caused uh, you know, appeals, that kind of thing. So the age limit was uh, proposed. And actually I was a town meeting member at the time. And I wish I could remember the year I got up and I spoke against it because mm -hmm. uh, believe it or not, had that age limit been in place in 1999, I would not have been hired by the Belmont Police Department. Mm -hmm. And so is Jesse, there... the, the answer to your question, it was basically to, um, it, was, it was presented under the guise of, we wanted people to be healthy, in shape and, and all yeah. that stuff, which, you know, it, but it was really done to prevent uh, the incident that had been going on where they had a, a gentleman who was in his 60s applying for the position. Is there any opportunity for Belmont to look at what, you know, um, that upper age limit? If, 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 for instance, this article didn't pass, would we be able to come before town meeting and reassess that at some point in time? I think that's the way it went in. The age limit mm -hmm. went in was at town meeting. So I would, I would imagine that that's okay. how it would go out as well. I just wanted to make sure. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. <clears throat> uh, next hand up is uh, Michael McNamara. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Michael McNamara, town meeting member, precinct seven. Um, so I was concerned when I saw this come up to town meeting. I remember my good old Belmont High School uh, civics class and the history behind patronage and the history behind some of the nepotism that was very prevalent in the 19th century. Now granted, there's been a lot of changes. So I decided to ask some of my constituents and they were horrified. They were absolutely shocked. They said, this will lose trust in the community. Don't do this, please don't do this. Don't vote for this. And what it heard is when you're speaking very eloquently on um, uh, Roy about the need to pass an override, this would tank public trust. I talked to people in my constituents, they are absolutely horrified. This will lead to friends of friends getting put in positions of leadership and they are not happy. They are angry with me. They're angry with the town. They're not happy about this. So I, I respect your opinion. I respect all the work Ms. Um, town Ministry of Garment has done, all the work the police chief, Mick Isaac has done, all the work that um, uh, the fire chief Haley has done, but my constituents are hopping. They're not happy. And they really feel like this is opening the door to people who are friends of friends or people who are politically connected, often who mm -hmm. aren't already in the community, getting into positions that they shouldn't. And they were said they want at least some level of trust in the people and the applicants we are doing. Um, so I just want to let you know what my people are telling me. Thank you. Well, my, Michael, my my belief right now is that uh, that's actually not well founded, but I, I would leave it to, I don't know, Chief McIsaac, do you want to take that question on? Because uh, the, Absolutely. we're trying to make it more of a merit-based. Uh, I'll tell you right now, I have, I have two, my, my oldest son and my oldest daughter in their twenties, they could, they're the age they could be police officers. My son, my youngest in two years would be. If they wanted to be police officers in, in, in a bad way, the best thing I could do for them would be to keep the department in civil service because there would be literally nobody that they would be competing with to, when they took the civil service exam. Um, be much harder to hire somebody um, that I'm connected to or whatever through this. You know, we fully anticipate that we're going to negotiate um, with the unions about a hiring process. I just spoke to uh, the Wellesley police chief the other day. The process they have, their union sits at the table, has a voice at the table. If they say, no, we're not hiring this person, they don't hire the person. The candidates do a ride along with the offices. In any part of that process, if the offices that are on that committee uh, don't feel as though the candidate is worthy, they don't hire. And that's speaking for Wellesley. Um, it's absolutely, we don't, I could, I, if we stay the course we are right now, and if my three kids wanted to be police officers, they'd probably all be police officers in Belmont within the next 10 years. We have two sets of brothers working on the force. We have a number of brother-in-laws and sister-in-laws on the force. Um, it's just, it's, um, you know, 
there aren't a lot of people in Belmont taking the job to be police officers. And certainly in this day and age, we're not going to attract any more from Belmont. I'd also like to speak to just the hiring process in the town in general. It is very fair, well vetted, thorough process when we hire anyone in any department in town. Um, so to think that there would be um, patronage and, and political appointees, I think is, is not fully understanding of, of the processes that we have in place in town. I think, I think the other thing that um, is concerning is sometimes we don't even have a choice um, with civil service, especially in the fire department as the chief, uh, acting chief Wayne Haley alluded to, um, when there's layoffs in another community, there's a state list that we have to go to before we can even look at the local list. So we're, we're losing choice. And, and I don't, in this day and age, when, when we need choice more than anyone and anything, um, we want to be able to hire the best candidates to serve the residents of this community. And we want the choice to be able to pick those individual candidates. Um, this is not about patronage. This is not about any political type of gamesmanship. This is about who we can hire, who the best people are. We're hearing a lot in the community about diversity. We wanted to diversify um, the employees in town. There is no way to do that. It's very difficult under civil service. It, so, it, it, sorry, Jimmy. Just one more point. The, the other thing, Michael, you talked about, you talked about promoting people up that wouldn't, you know, that were connected. Um, I don't know if, uh, I'm not gonna speak for the fire department, but the promotional process, the way it works here is in the police department is around April, um, you say, okay, we're, we're possibly gonna have a couple of vacancies next year. And you know, vacancies have the, the, the trickle down effect. So we're gonna give a lieutenant's and sergeant's exam next October. So officers say, okay. And now if you wanna participate in that promotional process, you start studying in April. The exam is basically, uh, you get overloaded with, with books. None of it is really relevant to what goes on in Belmont. Um, you're gonna get asked about uh, issuing search warrants at homicide scenes, things like that. So you study for, for about a good six or seven months. You take the exam in October. The, the results come out at Christmas time. If you're lucky, it's before Christmas. If after, it's, it's you know, depend on what you get. And we have a list, very same as the hiring list. Now, I don't know if the union, uh, the police union is gonna to speak to it, but we had four or five years when nobody would sign up to take a science exam and we had a vacancy. We had two vacancies. So we ended up provo promoting provisionally and hoping that those two provisionals that had sat in that position, those provisional positions for a year, took the test and did well enough to get promoted, which fortunately they did. So you run into people not passing the test you need to have four people sign up to take the test. If you don't have four people, you can't even give the exam. So we had a number of years when nobody took it. I just promoted two sergeants to lieutenant who are very uh, capable and you know very good promotions, but they're the only two sergeants in the department that signed up to take the lieutenant's exam. So, or that actually they took the lieutenant's exam. So, because it's so, it's, it's, it's a lot of work to get promoted. It's a lot of money. They spend money on classes. We get out of civil service. We negotiate a process for promotions. We can do it through assessment centers uh, more quickly. And we can, we can add an appeal process into it in, in the whole thing. So, you know, it's not just the hiring process. It's the promotional process as well. If, if I can just say one, one, last, one, more, yeah. one last thing, just really quick. I, I appreciate your, your argument. I appreciate what you're saying. And I, I hear you. I'm just telling you from what I'm hearing from people who I am responsible to as a town meeting member, they are deeply uncomfortable. So there's a huge gap between what, what you're saying and what the people are feeling, breathing, seeing, hearing. And I think that there needs to be addressed. And I think that it'd be hard for me to vote for something unless I could get more of the public, sort of the public opinion on in favor of this. And right now, everyone I've talked to has been strongly against, strongly against, not just like, well, so Michael, uh -huh. what I would, what I would say to your consistent constituents is a couple of things. This is all existing employees will be grandfathered in. They're not losing their civil service status. We're talking about new hires. The workforce these days are very different from 1915 when this first came into place. I, I, I strongly um, would encourage you to, to look at that. What we see when, 
when we're hiring these days is a definitely different mindset when it comes to um, workforce. And we, we need to change what we're doing to meet the needs of the new workforce. And what we would like to do is, is to have this opportunity to address those needs. And again, this is just um, new hires, the existing employees will be covered under civil service. So, um, uh, Ross, I, I, I was going to ask you if you wanted to comment on this. Yeah, uh, we have to. Un can Ross, un uh, you're unmuted now. Uh, can you hear me, Roy? Yes. Oh, thank you. I appreciate uh, you guys uh, letting us uh, join you tonight. Um, we uh, can understand some of the issues the town may have with civil service, and I just want to say that um, civil service is not the issue on uh, the problem with some of the issues that are being brought up tonight. Um, as far as the amount of candidates that, uh, that both Chief McIsaac and uh, Acting Chief Haley have, um, that's limited by the town. It's not limited by civil service. We put a resident re residency restriction on our hiring and a paramedic restriction on our hiring in the fire department. This is easily uh, work workable if you wanna make one hire a resident and the very next hire open to veterans from anywhere. If you take a look at the list and anyone can go to the civil service website and look up any of these lists, everything is transparent and on their uh, website. If you go to Belmont Police, uh, there are. Chief McIsaac is absolutely right. There's nine Belmont residents on there. If you open it up to all veterans from anywhere in the state, it immediately goes to 497. Uh, and far as the uh, the fire department goes, we have a we uh, we run a paramedic uh, program in ALS to serve the community, which is a great program. It's the highest medical we can out on the street. Uh, we are at a point now where we could be doing the same thing. We could hire one paramedic, we could hire one resident or one someone from outside of uh, Belmont. Uh, and that list goes exponentially higher as well. Uh, there are plenty of diverse candidates on these lists uh, that we can take advantage of. We, civil service is not just a testing system. It is also a recruitment system. You can go on to the civil service Twitter page or Facebook page and look at how many departments they go out and do open houses and how to take the civil service exam and how to be successful at the civil service exam. These are all communities that do it every day. It's Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, Randolph, Brockton. I just saw Channel 5 the other night. Lowell Police Department had a young lady that was a uh, some sort of a social worker. She's always wanted to be a police officer. She went to the Lowell Police Department, talked to a chief or a deputy chief, said, we'll help you uh, pass the civil service exam and become a police officer. She's getting ready to come out of the academy now. Has Belmont truly done everything they can to expand their lists and make uh, the hiring process easier for themselves? I, I, would, I would, the only thing I would say to that, Russ, is if the state, um, the state's also moving in the direction of making it easier for towns to to get out of civil service. They're, they're also seeing the issues that, that involve civil service. So I would say that this isn't a Belmont thing. This is a statewide initiative to move towards getting out of civil service. And I, I would suspect in the next decade, you will see more and more towns be being removed from civil service. Okay, well, let's move on to the next uh, question. Uh, uh, Emily Peterson. One thing, Ryan? Uh, yeah, but we have to be quick. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah no problem. Um, you know, we talk of, of, about uh, what Mr. McNamara was talking about all you have to do is Google the Wellesley Fire Department roster and take a look at the names that are on that roster. There are four names with the chief of the department's uh, last name. Uh, and this has all happened since they got out of civil service. I've spoken to many of the Wellesley firefighters who are absolutely distraught trying to get back into civil service because there's lack of testing, there's delays in, in testing for promotions. Um, th there's plenty of issues with this. We can handle any issue that the town has with civil service in civil service. There are plenty of people at civil service that will talk and help. They have set up booths at the MMA conference, which is the conference for towns and administrators. They're there to help. We just need to open up and ask for their help. And I'm sure we can handle whatever and keep the employees uh, of the fire department and police department in civil service 
We've already had our health insurance changed. We're looking to have it possibly go to the GIC. We've already been told we're getting 0% colas and maybe for the next three years, it's just a kick in the teeth. But Ross, again, this is not going to impact any existing employees. This will not impact anybody that currently had to um, have to um, yep. accept some of those changes that the town has had to make. It, it affects promotions because once you make a uh, take a promotional exam, you can a civil service. Well, let's actually, I, which we can bargain. I, I, I promise that we, we should return to the promotions issue uh, after a couple of more people have a chance to speak because we, we need to, there's a lot of people lined up. Uh, Emily Peterson. Hi, um, I, I have a, a question, but first, um, Ross, could you identify who you are? Um, so oh, sure, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Ross Bonner, uh, Belmont uh, firefighter for 21 years. I grew up in town uh, and- uh, Thank you. Know. Okay, yeah, I, I, um, I wanted, I wanted my, one of my question was, were there, we gonna hear from any of the men and women in service that weren't uh, chiefs? Um, or, you know, my father was a fireman, uh, never, never went for lieutenant or anything my whole life. So I understand a little bit from that side, but um, I, I think the arguments made do make sense in some way with, with regard to finding the most qualified candidates. Um, but I'm wondering if maybe there might be a way to satisfy both sides and that um, perhaps the administration of the town could work with um, the firefighters and, and police officers and, and town members that are concerned about um, leaving civil service and put into place some guidelines about hiring. Um, for instance, what um, the um, Chief McIsaac said about having officers um, on the hiring board and the union present and, you know, certain, uh, you know, it, an interview panel, if you will, that is made up of a diverse set of people within the department so that we could protect against, I think some of the fears that I'm hearing uh, from, from Ross and um, Mac, um, you know, uh, so anyways, and I'm uh, sorry, town meeting member precinct one. <laughs> Emily, that's, that's a fair question. And actually that ties back actually to the promotions issue that just came up because I think the question really is what would life look like if Belmont left civil service? And, um, there clearly would be uh, procedures put in place that uh, I, I think would be as reasonable as the way hiring we do for any other town department, whether it's DPW or facilities or whatever, as 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 Jess alluded to. And uh, there are certainly models in other communities about how to go about this. That 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 the rights of the employees would be protected and the and the interests of the town would be promoted. But uh, and Patrice, who do you think is best suited to describe in maybe a little more detail how this might work? So again, this would, would go back to negotiations. Um, we are stopping at town meeting first. We are getting permission to be removed from civil service. And then from there, we will be going to the bargaining table to kind of iron out some of the promotional language, some of the hiring language um, that we would um, utilize in police and fire moving forward. I think that those those are the nuances that the town has to work out. I will say that aside from promotions and diversity of, of, of the employment, there are financial issues as well. As well. I mean, this is a multifaceted um, issue. It's not just one thing that we can address. There, there's a, a lot of issues in regards to civil service and, and how it would benefit the town um, to remove civil service. Financially, we have been looking at structural changes, well, how we can move the town forward to be more efficient and to provide the, the taxpayers some relief. We are doing that and we believe civil service is a way to address that. There are um, significant dollars that could be saved um, by removing the town from civil service. One of them was through the overtime in the vacancies that occur with civil service because of the length of time that we have to wait. Jamie alluded to, um, an issue earlier where if he, he can't find the candidate he wants, he has to start all over again. And that just causes more time to be um, tacked on to that process. Sure, I, 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 uh, yeah, um, sounds loud all of a sudden. Um, I guess where I'm going is uh, it sounds, I agree with all of the points you said and I listened to the presentation and I think a lot of, a lot of that makes sense, but it might smooth the path if the, um, some of the um, concerns uh, brought forward um, were, were maybe put in place before the vote because it seems like 
if we vote to leave, um, then it's kind of already decided. And um, this might be the chance for um, those with these concerns to, to have their voices heard, uh, even if it's just about the high, like, even if it's just saying, this is the interview committee, like that doesn't solve all the problems, but maybe that smoothes your path a little bit and addresses some sure. of the problems. And that, and that actually, that actually came up, Emily, as one of, um, we, we talked about that and there's a considerable amount of work and Jess can tell you in bargaining any negotiations. It, it is it's time consuming. It takes it takes considerable um, effort and work of the staff to to get that done. We didn't want to have to to participate in that and then go to town meeting and for some reason town meeting to say no. Uh, we want to make sure we're using our time effectively that staff okay. time is being used effectively. Yeah, that makes sense. So Thank we you. feel that the issues that Ross has pointed out, and, and especially with regard to the promotion, we can iron those out in negotiations at the table after the town meeting vote. Okay, thank you, Emily. Let, let me move on to the next speaker because the line is getting ever longer. Uh, Jean Mooney. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Thank you for having this, um, this uh, webinar. Um, I wanted to, uh, I agree with a number of the things that um, Emily had, had just said, but by the way, Jean Mooney, town meeting member, precinct six. Um, so things such as the ab absolute preference and the age, or those are all things that can come up, particularly the absolute preference, which seems to you know trump lots of other things where you, um, in, in town where if, if you, uh, uh, in terms of military service. I mean, I had a son who served in the military. I know a number of uh, folks in town who served the military and, and, they're, and they're serving in our, um, um, uh, in these positions. Um, but um, the absolute preferences are something that would be done in collective bargaining um, that would necessarily change the rank order of those um, preferences. So that's just one of my questions. I'm gonna take it. Sure. So what, hi hey Gene. So what I've seen uh, different, uh, you know, Lexington to use them as an example. You 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 craft a, an entrance exam. Um, you have a company in Arlington gives an entr entrance exam, which also has a psychological component to it. Right now, it's it's two different components. And as a community, you can decide. You can say, we're going to give four points to veterans. We're going to give eight points to veterans who live in Belmont. We're going to give uh, four points for people who have a bachelor's degree. We're going to give uh, four points, you know, so on. You can tailor it any way, any way you'd like. You can say, uh, you know, we're going to give X number of points to sons and daughters of police and firefighters who were killed on the line of duty. Um, you know, you have that flexibility to do that. Now, different communities do it differently. Uh, the Western police chief now has basically just gone to, to submitting people submitting resumes. To the department. They're a much smaller department. So, you know, they, they might even have more greater flexibility than we would. But you can basically tailor the entr entrance exam how you want. And you and you know, if you, you have a language need, you can give points for the language and, and so forth. Thank you. That's good to hear. I had a, a question and I don't know if uh, um, Ross, if you can answer this. I mean, obviously all the town meeting members received a letter from um, which was signed um by from the members of belmont's pol uh, fire and police departments um that's a little bit vague for me i don't know if that's you know all, all of them everyone some of them um so that's question number one and then just a general comment is that i i, I feel that um i would hope that we could have more of a sense of a tone of, of general trust in government which i think we all need in terms of everyone who is serving and whether it's our police, our, our, our firefighters, the, um, our, our uh, people on the select board or anywhere in government. And I would like to s feel that we're moving towards a place of, of trust and transparency. And so um, I would hope that we could have a system um, based on that first. Um, but anyway, I'd like to uh, put Ross, if you could under clarify the letter and who that represents, I'd appreciate it. Sure, thank you, Mrs. Mooney. Um, yes, that's uh, the letter came from a vast majority of both uh, the fire and police departments, which uh, the police department would include the patrolmen and the superior officers. Um, it came from both sides. We're uh, all united in this. And it keeps on getting brought up that this only affects new hires. Um, so one would think that the town meeting members could wonder why we are putting up such a fight. 
in the importance of civil service as a transparent, uh, independent checks and balances for everything um, should really uh, raise some red flags for the town meeting members. That if there, if it doesn't uh, affect us, uh, except for new hires, although it does affect us for um, promotions. If I go to take a promotional exam and I get promoted to lieutenant, I now come out of civil service and I lose any type of protection from civil service. Um, it's there for a reason. Um, and it's just that important. It, this is such a complex, complex subject. Um, I, we have had, me and Corey have had many uh, town meeting members calling us, emailing us to discuss the issues. And it's not a, it's not a 30 minute conversation. It's an hours long conversation because it's, it's that complex. And we're bringing this to the table in a pretty quick fashion. And that's coming from town meeting members. Town meeting members are saying, I just don't understand why they're doing this so quick and what have you. I mean, we're, we're literally talking about uh, the budgets in the next couple of years where 15, 20 firefighters and police officers can get laid off. Well, what are we gonna do? We're gonna lay out, if we lay off uh, 15 uh, firefighters, that's gonna be two of our females. Half of our females that are on the department would be laid off. So how are we helping diversity and so forth by doing this? We can fix this while we're in civil service. This is not an issue. And I'm sure anyone uh, that would wanna call civil service, they'll give you those answers as well. Thank you. I'll let I would, um, sorry, Jean, go ahead. Um, I would just categorically disagree with everything Ross just said. Um, I do not think it's accurate. And I do think it's a, a misrepresentation of what we're trying to do. I would, I would ask both union reps, uh, Ross Bonner and Corey Taylor, to give me one name of a firefighter or police officer that's benefited from civil service in the last 21 years, either through an employment grievance or a promotional bypass. Just okay. one. Okay. So um, I, I have house insurance and I have car insurance. I've had it for 30 years. Never used it once, but it's nice to have just in case. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Lisa uh, Pargoli is next. Hi, uh, Lisa Pargoli, Precinct 4 Town Meeting Member. Hi. And um, I had two questions that I would like to ask, please. Um, one, as a town meeting member, and I've been talking with other town meeting members, uh, we'd like to know why the select board is proposing this major change now prior to negotiations during this pandemic and with almost no public process. Um, we just seems to, that it's being rushed through and we would think it seems to be worthy of um, public consideration for discussion. Corey, I don't know if you wanna take it. Well, uh, th this is a year, for, uh, I think the select board said early on, this is a year to, <laughs> uh to try to undertake as much meaningful structural change as we can it's it I, I think we owe it to the voters the goal is tonight and at town meeting and at the warren committee briefing tomorrow night is to educate people on the issues and uh make that decision i i do believe that um the town would be better off by leaving civil service we felt we had an obligation to uh bring that choice before town meeting. Thank you. Um, and the second question is um, that we've only had vague claims of cost savings with no specific dollar figure savings presented specifically. So um, could you specifically tell us about what the um, proposed cost savings are to the taxpayers? Uh, I know that Jamie and, and Wayne have both uh, been working on that. Uh, Jamie, you have some information for the police department, I understand. Oh, okay. I did. I mentioned it uh, early on. Yeah. So basically, uh -huh. when, we're, when we're down staff, um, like we are now, our overtime goes up. And you can yeah. argue that, yeah, that overtime would be balanced by salaries, but it, it's not. And it's not an efficient way to run a department. In 2012, 2013, our overtime in 2013, we had four vacancies was $373,000. Four years later, including step raises and pay raises in 2017, we were fully staffed. Our overtime was $278,000, a difference mm -hmm. of $94,000 in those two years. Mm -hmm. just, just the way it is. Now, you know, some people, we look at that, I look at that from a management uh, position as being, 
it's an inefficient way to run an operation. But if I'm one of those offices, that's overtime money in my pocket. So it's not necessarily a bad thing when the department short, short staff mm -hmm. for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Wayne, you also had some numbers, didn't you, earlier today? Yeah, um, so I ran some numbers on the last five years of um, vacancies created by retirements prior to the um, replacement of that firefighter. And <clears throat> generally using civil service with the, the lag time that it takes us to get somebody hired, it's about four months conservatively. And then we have to send them to the fire academy a lot of times. So that's another couple of months at least um, where you know, we're paying somebody to backfill the position. So conservatively speaking, um, each firefighter vacancy creates about 16 weeks of um, overtime. And that over five years is uh, $771,000. So um, what I think we can do with a, a different process of reducing the time it takes to get somebody on board um, is, mm -hmm. We could get we could bring that down to four to six weeks to get them hired and through the physical process and the uh, the other things they have to go through to get to get hired interviews and stuff um, and that's a half a million dollar savings just going from that much overtime sixteen weeks to uh, say four to six weeks so thank um, you that is our hope and that is what we're we're trying to achieve through this. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the main thing at the fire department is, is the efficiency and um, not only hiring who we want to hire, but to be able to use our own process and not have to wait for civil service to have an exam and to wait for them to respond to us and to tell us who we need to hire and so forth. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, David Lind is next. Good evening, this is David Lind. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. I'm a uh, town meeting member from Precinct 1. I guess I uh, first just wanna appreciate and thank you all for this tonight. I think it's been a great discussion. I've learned, certainly learned a whole lot about uh, the decision we all have to make. Um, one question I had is, you know, I keep hearing that there's several other towns that have already done this. You know, and we've heard examples on both sides of pros and potentially cons with folks that all having the same last name. I, I guess I'm curious, what, what other data out there is there from the impacts on these towns, from the hiring process, from the unions, what they're saying? And, and you know, I, I think one of the benefits of not being first in something like this is that we've got peers who we can learn from. So I'm just curious to learn a little bit more about what, what the experiences in those towns have been like. Well, I, I can tell you that the, the number of towns that is leaving is, is only growing. I don't know of anybody who has uh, gone back to civil service after having left it, but... Uh, uh, Patrice, do you have any more information on that? No, but I think Jamie does. I, I can just uh, reflect both with Lexington, Wellesley Police. I'm not going to talk about it. I don't know anything about Wellesley Fire Department. <laughs> both of them expressed to me, I said, how did you present this to the unions? How did this, you know, do this? Look, you know, we carry, we carry firearms. We have a very important job, right? I hope there's nobody in this organization that, that I work in that does not want to hire the best possible candidate and does not want the flexibility to hire the best possible candidate. And Chief Corr in Lexington, he said, that's how we presented it. He said, they're on board. We want to work with good people. We want to work with people that are better able to understand the various backgrounds and cultures within our community. We want these people. Why forever should we, should we block people out? There could be potentially good police officers here in Belmont. And I'm just going to take this opportunity to, to talk one more time about the diversity thing. When I went for the police chief's job and I sat down with Rick White for the first time, he said to me, I almost went through the roof. He said, Jamie, you and Chief McLaughlin have dropped the ball because you never called for an all minority list. I said, Rick, you can't. And as soon as he left my office, I called um, Bruce Howard, who was then the operations director at civil service. He said, tell me how I can diversify this department because I got people in the community telling me that we haven't done the right thing. Bruce said there's three ways. You recruit within your community. So we go out in the community and we recruit people and we tell them, please take the exam. Yeah, it's not for two years, but take it. And hopefully you'll score well enough to be in the top three. The second rule is rule number eight, civil service rule number eight. We go to civil service and we say, half of the calls that we go to 
the people speak French. So we need a French speaking officer. That's not gonna happen in Belmont. And rule number three and, and part number 10 of civil service is you admit to a past practice of racial discrimination in the town's hiring, you get under a consent decree and they put together a, a list for the minorities that you've, um, you, you've um, treated un, unfairly, which we didn't do. And Bruce in that, in that same vein said, he goes, Jamie, if you wanna diversify your department, the only other option you have to do is to get out of civil service. That's it. Calling for all veterans is not gonna diversify a department. Veterans, I give veterans all the credit in the world for, for serving our country. That doesn't mean they make good police officers, all of them. Um, they're just like everybody else. And, and you know, to, to hamstring yourself, to limit the people that you're gonna have uh, working this very important job, um, it, it's crazy in this day and age. We wouldn't ask John Phelan to hire teachers that came off a list that they gave every two years. I don't know why the police department's any different. Uh, David, anything else? I, I'd love to hear from some of the some of the union union reps as well, just to hear hear what everyone else is saying. Uh, Ross or Corey, do you have yeah, like to comment on that? Sure. Um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, uh, you know, when we were talking about open up the uh, the list to veterans, I'll tell you right now that as of 2017, uh, the diversity in our armed forces is 42%. Of the 42%, 39% are African American, 36% are Latino, 15% are uh, Asian American, and then it just goes down the line from there. So if there is a way that you want to diversify your department, open it up to veterans, and the, the simple numbers will take care of themselves and you will get some good applicants here. Our armed for forces train people to work under high stress, high pressure conditions. I couldn't want anything more for a firefighter or a police officer to come to me with that type of training. So we're gonna get Ross. the veterans, we're gonna get the veterans that were not hired in the communities they live in. So with any veteran that was not picked up in Boston, any veteran that was not picked up in Cambridge, any veteran, and I don't know if it's such if that's such a great way to diversify your department. I don't know why Boston's not doing it, why Cambridge isn't doing it, why Lowell and all these other communities that need to diversify their departments aren't doing it. That is civil service. And the simple fact of the matter is they're all going to be out of civil service within the next five years. You know, the other thing is, you know, it strikes me that there are literally people marching in the streets asking for diversification in, in departments, and I, I would, think this I is an opportunity. Much, I would much prefer rather to go to a UMass Lowell or Fitchburg State or a UMass Amherst job fair and encourage people to apply for the job here than to rely on, on an that arbitrary can list. Well. It can so be I, that combination. It doesn't have to be one singular, it can be both. And just, just to go back on to the, just really quickly on the overtime, both the police and fire have uh, places in their contract that if we give the town a year's notice of our retirement, they give us a 5% bumping our salary for a year. A year seems like a very adequate amount of time to hire someone. Uh, Chief Haley just eloquently spoke that it takes four, four months to come from stuff from civil service and a couple of months to be in the academy, which is six or seven months. That is not a civil service problem. That is a problem that we may need to start the process a little bit quicker. The reason why the town came to us to do put that in the contract is to help save money in overtime. There shouldn't, if the, we don't have a lag, then there is no overtime. Or if we're adequately staffed, then there is no overtime. Or if you are using overtime, it's cheaper to pay someone one and a half times with just one set of benefits than hiring two full-time people with full-time benefits. So like I say, civil service is not the issue and the problem here. It, it, we can work through civil service to take care of any of these problems. It just has to be done properly. I just want to, can I just get back to my original question about other towns? So looking at some of the, our neighboring peer towns who have done this and what the what the perspective and what the you know presuming your your perspective from the union point of view is that the union's view this has been a terrible experience in those towns i guess i'm, I'm just curious to hear a little bit more and understand what why well for a lot so of the towns that have come out of civil service i believe 20 to 30 are police departments and six are fire departments um if you take a look at burlington or lexington uh those are the two police departments that have been talked about 
the Burlington Fire Department came out, they got a uh, payment for their full Quinn bill, which is an education incentive, which is anywhere between 10 and 25%, depending on the degree you have, and a 15% COLA increase. So anywhere between 10% and 40% increase in pay. That's why they came out. Police. Yeah, in the police department. And Lexington is the same thing. They got, they got their Quinn bill, uh, which is an education incentive. I don't know what their, uh, their increase in their COLA was, but I was heard it was, it was pretty decent. So they're, the reason that a lot of these departments come out is, is simply for money. We're not looking to come out. We're not looking for this money. And I don't think the town has this money. We're, we're looking at three years of $12 million shortfalls. H how, you know, would that, uh, you know, do anyone any good? So Lexington came out because they were short staffed by 25%. They had three people on their last civil service test. That's six more than we've got. Then we've got six more than they have now. And another two years, we're not going to have anybody on our civil service list. It's not as easy as just hiring veterans from other communities. And we already have Quinn, so we already have that factored into our salaries. Uh, thank you, David. Let's, uh, we can come back to this later, maybe. Uh, but we, I'd like to move on to the next uh, questioner, Heather Rubeski. Hi, thanks, uh, Precinct Member 7. I am interested in knowing how the select board based this decision to put this on the warrant for September because we are heading into the override and that this would somehow benefit us when the only financial numbers we've been presented with seem to be rapidly prepared for tonight and there is no financial analysis or report for us to see about the projected impact this will have on the override or the cost savings to the town going forward. And specifically, when we look at the override, I mean, the um, overtime money being what continually is brought up, I'm very interested in knowing what the costs are, the new costs that the town will incur in order to manage all of the new systems that will have to be put into place, the new testing that we will have to do ourselves. Um, this simply isn't something where someone's gonna snap their fingers and we know how to do it all and it's going to happen tomorrow with no money and no time spent. So I'd be interested in hearing about both of those things, thanks. Heather, we have not um, done a, a detailed line item kind of uh, analysis to date, but I, I am convinced that the savings are there based on the discussions I've had with the, the chiefs and with Patrice. And the fact that so many of so many other towns are also leaving indicates to me that's where the market is headed. And that you've heard tonight from the chiefs that they expect there to be a, a great increase in the number of towns leaving civil service in the next five years. I think that's where modern government is headed. But uh, I'd leave it to uh, either the chiefs or Patrice to comment further. I, I would say that in, in, the, in regards to the comment about why now, I've been here almost, what, three years? It's been talked about since I've been here. Um, I know the union, the fire union specifically has been talking about it for about six years. So I think on, in terms of discussion, it has been there. Um, I think we would have probably had it um, on a town meeting warrant last year, but you know, we, we wanted to give it more time to, to figure out and to discuss it. And then obviously COVID happened and everything else got kind of screwed up there. I will say that um, it was mentioned when we hired the police chief, it was civil service and, and the aspects of being removed from civil service, it was discussed then. So I do believe that it has been discussed thoroughly. We had the financial task force um, that was appointed, I believe in January of 2019. It's been a discussion point in those meetings. Um, so it's really, it's a, it's a lot of different things. It's, it's the structural deficit, the operating override, it's the discussions with the unions, it's all those things. And it culminates to a September town meeting where we can ask the town meeting reps to, to decide whether or not they want to remove the town from civil service. You know, uh, I'll just say for, for me, um, it's not about the money. <laughs> um, it's about running a, a you know, being the best police department in the area, hiring the best people. You hire wrong people, they can cost you money for a long time uh, that you can't, you can't put a dollar figure on. 
Um, I'm fully prepared to implement the hiring policy, to fully engage the union, take their input. This is larger than me. Whatever we do at town meeting in a couple of weeks is going to last long beyond any of us are here tonight. Um, the, the, the exam process, um, Lexington uses exam solutions in, in Arlington. It doesn't cost them a dime. They, the, the applicants pay $140 to take the test. They get the results in three days and, and you can begin the hiring process. So it's not about the money. I wish we had money to give the unions. Um, you know, that's my own thing. I'm not speaking for the selectmen or anything because yeah, these other communities, they gave up this wonderful, great credit, this great benefit of civil service for a pay raise, for a one-time pay raise. And, um, you know, we're not in that position, but I have to run an organization. Uh, just look at the, the, look at the news today, you know? I wanna run an organization with the best people in it. I don't wanna be restricted in who I can hide, hire. I don't wanna have to, you know, fill out lengthy forms to why I don't wanna hire somebody who hasn't worked in five years and, and that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's not about the money for me. It's about running a successful organization, keeping that organization going forward in, in the best and most efficient way possible for the town of Belmont. I appreciate those responses, but I haven't heard an answer to either of my questions yet. Is there going to be a cost analysis? If this is being pitched by the select board to town meeting, and I will have to vote on this in a couple of weeks, what, what is the answer that you're going to give when people raise their hand at town meeting and ask, are we actually going to save money? And what are those expenses, the new expenses that will be incurred in having to do for ourselves the things that right now are being managed by the civil service? I mean, honestly, Heather, some of those questions can't be answered because some of them are gonna be dependent on how we bargain um, at the table after the, the vote. I, I, I can't speak to what's gonna happen at the bargaining table. So, so I, are, I you, are we saying that there is a chance that we will go and vote at town meeting for this and then not save money? No, I do believe there's a, there is a savings. There's an absolute savings as the chiefs indicated um, with some of their analysis that they've done already in regards but, to- the, But the no, one has, no one's looked at what costs will be incurred in order, in, in new costs, right? Like I, I just, it's a simple question. <laughs> we're changing the system of how we're doing this. So what, are the things that Belmont will have to do for itself and we will have to spend money on, whether it is human time that we are paying for or systems we're purchasing. I, on it, right I, I can tell are, you are I, done elsewhere. the assessments are already being done. We, we already pay for that. I, I honestly cannot think of something that would, would impact the town in such a significant way that it would be something that, um, that I would be that concerned about. Yes, their analysis has not been done as Roy indicated. There is unfortunately a limited amount of time and um, staff that we have currently working. We believe that given all the, all the um, benefits that I outlined in my um, presentation to removing the town from civil service, it goes beyond the money, it goes beyond um, the, the hiring. It, it, it's it's a, a complete package. And that's, that's the best I can answer right now. Uh, it's very multifaceted, but it makes me very uncomfortable that as a town meeting member being asked to vote on this and not being able to have questions like that answered. It, it absolutely makes me feel like I, I'm voting blind on half of the impacts of what this is. And I understand the, the HR side of what's been discussed tonight. Um, and and it, we keep coming back to that, which is why I'm pressing on this question. But, um, but, you know, no there, offense it, intended to anyone, but we no, need but, to be, but, but we need answers. Very, there's an important piece of this. The, the incremental testing costs and all of that are, are really negligible. There's no question that the quality of the, of the output would be higher. But as Patrice said, much of the detail really depends on negotiations with the unions after the fact, and we we consciously chose um, to wait for town meeting approval before undertaking those negotiations because that's going to be an arduous process, and we and we can't quantify the result now. We have we have to do the process. We have to do those negotiations to get there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just. I don't know what, and a, different, a different way of answering that because these, it's the result is going to be what we mutually agree upon. But 
but we are convinced it will be a better outcome. Right, I, I think it's similar to, if you wanna use the example of a structural change, like a regionalizing a dispatch, um, there are cost savings that could be identified in, in a, a case like that, but there's a lot of that goes into a regional dispatch agreement with another town. And, and I don't know if that would be something that we would be able to present to a town meeting if that ever were to get to a vote of town meeting. So there's a lot of nuances in this, Heather, and I, I wish I could answer your question and be able to give you an, an absolute answer of what the town could save, but I, I just, we can't, I don't have that information for you right now. If there is more analysis that could be done before town meeting, I just recommend that, you know, if, if we're serious about this and the reasoning of the select board is what, how it was presented, that this would help us when come override time. I think that um, as a town meeting member, I would request some much more detailed information on that side of things. Well, we, we are very, we are serious about it. And if, if we can do anything meaningful between now and town meeting, we will. Uh, Okay, uh, thank you, Heather. Uh, Judith Feinlieb is next. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Judith Feinlieb, town meeting member, precinct six. There's a lot that's already been said that I agree with, but I have a different issue to bring up. In the proposals, if that's the right word, that have been put forward, there's a lot of talk about what could be done, what might be done. But, and let us assume for the sake of discussion that everybody, there's no one here who would indulge in patronage. I see absolutely nothing in any of these proposals that guarantees that in the future, there will be no patronage, nor do I see anything that would define what that would be. And I am quite frankly, not comfortable voting for a removal from civil service unless I see something like that. And I see it essentially in lead. If that is before you talk to the union. Um, Jamie, can you can you take uh, that? Well, I, I would add maybe defer to Patrice and Jeff. So I don't know what the state ethics thinks about that, but we had uh, we wanted to hire uh, somebody to work as a part time dispatcher, and town council's um, opinion on that was that we could not hire that person because their spouse was a supervisor within our police department. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that if you want, put maybe more bluntly, is that if you want to change the process and you want to change the system, which is what's being proposed here, that those of us who feel strongly about the principle of civil service would have difficulty going along with this unless we see some way to guarantee that there will not be patronage in any new system. Does that make it a little clearer? Yeah, well, I, I can tell you, Judith, that the intent here, as I think all the speakers have indicated, is to have a process that's almost the opposite of patronage, where we could actually uh, hire the best person in each case. Before, I've, I'd like to see a guarantee. And I'm happy to take your word, Roy, and Chief McIsaac's and Patrice's word. But I don't know what's going to happen 10 years from now. And I would, I need to see, so you need to have something written in that makes sure that a new system doesn't go bad. Well, what do we do with patronage with other positions in town? I beg your pardon? Uh, I was kind of asking maybe the, the HR director. I'm, 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 I'm happy that people think so highly of the police and fire positions, but what do the other departments in town do to prevent patronage? Or, you know, is that, I know the state ethics law plays some kind of a role in that. You can't, you sign the payroll, your kids or your family members can't work for you. Sure, I, I can speak a little bit to that. Uh, Jessica Porter, the HR director for the town. Um, so just so people know, I, I guess I'm starting to think as I listen to some of the, the discussion and comments that I, feel in some ways it maybe thinks that everybody that works in town hall and Homer building are all related to one another. And we're all giving out jobs to family mm -hmm. and friends, which is definitely not the case. 
Um, our hiring process is extremely thorough um, on the town side. Um, those of you that followed uh, the town administrator search, the general manager search for the light department, the police search, those were very public and open search processes. So people really got to see the level of depth that a lot of our hirings go into. Now, obviously other positions in town don't warrant having a paid consultant to run an assessment center type search, but we always do typically panel reviews. Um, even for an administrative assistant, we usually have several people sitting on the panel um, a lot of times I might bring in somebody from another community, if depending on the position. Um, for our admin assistants, for example, I actually run them through a, a various uh, battery of, you know, computer testing, or sometimes we might even have kind of hands-on uh, reality recruiting, I like to call it, type exercises. But the, the point is that we have, you know, a lot of people sitting in, a lot of people reviewing the resumes. There's really no way that anybody could sneak through a family member or relative because of the checks and balances we have in place. And were we to come out of civil service, I would fully expect that the new hire process for our police and firefighters would follow a very similar process. Um, and I will say that I think in the five years that I've been with the town, I, I think I've hired maybe one family member of somebody that was already a town employee. And let me tell you, that individual worked probably harder for that position than anybody else because it was a family member. Um, so I feel that our hiring practices, you know, follow all of the, the laws and regulations and um, they're as transparent as they can possibly be. I'm not, let me say, just, I'm not suggesting that there's anything just, that anyone's doing wrong now. I'm simply asking how you're going to write in what sounds like a very good process so that it is there essentially in the books for the future. Well, Ju and, Judith, I don't... You know, I can't tell you exactly how it will be done, but uh, it should be clear that is it is the intent to achieve that. And we will, I'm, I guess it's an act of faith that you have to believe we will get there because I that is- I think was trying to say something. Yeah. Sorry? Ross was trying to say something, I think. Uh, Ross, yeah, please. And then- uh, Really, really, really quick. So just uh, uh, Mrs. Finley, thank you very much for the question. Just want to let you know that uh, the hiring in the police and fire department lie with the police chief and the fire chief. They are strong chiefs. They do the hiring and firing for both departments. It does not go through human resources. Um, that's not true. They both departments actively have my office involved with everything that they do. Um, so yes, they are the appointing authority at the end of the day. And technically speaking, in any department, the department head typically is the deciding factor, but they right. would have a very hard time justifying a decision that the rest of the panel might have gone against. Right. I, I, I apologize, Jess. I, I meant to say that the final judgment goes with the police chief and the fire chief as strong chiefs. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ross. Uh, Chris Doyle is next. He's on mute, I think. Uh, yeah, can, can somebody you, can unmute you hear me? Yeah, can now you you're good. Okay, yep. thanks, sorry. My, I had two questions and I promise not to ask multiple follow-ups. Um, my first question is whether or not um, the teachers who are about half the employees in town, I think somewhere around there, do they have the um, benefit of civil service or just the benefit of a union? And uh, I don't wanna get into a long thing about teachers, but it seems like our teacher uh, hiring practices have worked decently well. So if they're not protected by civil service, then I'm having trouble understanding why we should have it in part of the town and not in the other town. So that's my first question. My second question is if somebody could tell me the number of women who work in the police department and the number of women who work in the fire department and what percentage that is of both sets of employees. Well, Chris, the, the only civil service employees in Belmont are in police and fire, no, no other departments. And in terms of the gender breakout, I'd have to ask the chiefs. We have seven females. Uh, out, out of how many? Out of 49. Seven out of 49. Yep. Okay. And how about in the fire department? Uh, we have four out of 52. Four out of 52. So less than 10%. Yep. 
and Correct. slightly more in the police department. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, Deb Lockett is next. Can you hear me now? Deb Lockett here, yes. town meeting precinct seven. Um, I didn't think I heard Ross. Ross, are you a labor representative? I don't know that I heard in the introduction whether he is, but I also heard a name Corey um, mentioned. Does that mean that there are two representatives of the laborers um, unions here? Yes. Yes, Ms. Lockett. And so I would love to be able to hear also Corey and others that haven't spoken. I don't know that we've heard anything from Mr. Hurley, but before we move on, I'll just say, I sent out an article through the Belmont Listserv, but for everybody's information, I was doing some research on this and there is an article out there from January, 2020 from the town of Webster that also included Webster, Grafton, Marlboro, Uxbridge, Athol, and some other towns in that area that have also uh, gone through this um, process already of coming out of civil service. And I think it's a really great explanation and in writing that I'd like everybody who's on this call, I don't know how many people that is, that would be really great for them to take a look at because um, you know sometimes it's easier to read it than it is to hear. Um, and I'm my other question, and you can take me off mute from here is, uh, or put me on mute from here, is who is left out of this? I mean, I understand that change is very difficult um, and I'm hearing some strong opposition. I wanna try and figure out how um, we can address the concerns, but who is being left out if we move out of civil service? What sort of um, base demographic or, um, I, I don't know, I'll, I'll else to ask that question. Um, well, Deb, the, just to be clear, every, every existing uh, civil service employee will remain in civil service. Uh, so I'm not sure what you mean by left out. Am I still on? Yes. Um, okay, so everybody that's on civil services uh, remains. Um, I feel that the argument has been made pretty well for why on um, speed of hiring, number of people who we could hire, quality of, um, of applicants, uh, but if, and those all make sense to me. So why is there still opposition? And so who or what are we missing? What's missing? Maybe HR or HR director um, has some, I, I don't know, I haven't been able to tease out what is missing there. Jess, well, I don't know if you want to talk about the layoff procedure. Um, I know that assistant or I'm sorry, Acting Chief Haley has a little bit more um, info on the layoff list in terms of how that works when we get people in Belmont. But um, really one of the only arguments that I've heard from our union groups is the protection that a layoff would provide. So for example, if we do have to lay off any police or firefighters here in Belmont, they would, because of civil service, then have the ability to be placed on a layoff list where they would get first consideration in other communities that are hiring. Um, now, of course, that could be an employee who maybe lives in Belmont and their name gets pulled on a list out in, um, you know, somewhere out in the Berkshires and they probably don't even want that job. Um, but it would give them that protection. Um, but that's really the only significant argument that I have heard from the union groups as to why we need to stay in civil service is that layoff protection. Um, so I, I'm not really seeing a, a solid argument either, um, other than that one. Well, Ross or Corey, do you wanna uh, take that on from the employee point of view? Uh, Corey's having some troubles with his computer. If you guys can let uh, Mike Pellrine's computer in so they can, uh, he can take care of that. I but, do see Mike is in the queue to speak, Roy. Okay. Uh, Deborah, yeah, that is uh, one of the uh, main protections for us is if we are laid off, we do go to the top of the list. Uh, we have uh, lots of members that have spent many years uh, honing their craft, uh, are, are 
ex-retired uh, fire chief acting chief Haley have gone through extensive classes, uh, trainings, uh, and for that, if you get laid off um, and you have some place where you can uh, grab, get another job, that is certainly helpful. If we didn't have that, we'd be looking to find a, another type of job to do. And um, like I say, we, we're here for 32 years. Of course, 32 years, we spend a lot of time uh, dedicating our lives to our families and everything to protect the citizens of Belmont. And it's a great protection to have. Okay, so that, that one provision is something that gets talked about in whatever bargaining about if, I mean, across the board, if it doesn't. No, like, I mean, once, once a town comes out of civil service, they, that, that's it. They're not, the, the future hires uh, are not protected. That is one of the, the issues. Like, like I said, it, it might not affect me, but it's going to affect the person that's hired coming in after me. And uh, we, don't, we don't do things to betterment ourselves to, uh, to the detriment of someone else coming in. We, we're, we're, we're a brother and sisterhood. We, are, we take this job to help uh, the citizens and because we get to help people every day, we do not take these jobs to become millionaires. And it's the one sure uh, protection that we have uh, to make sure that we can keep on doing the job that we love. Okay, Deb, so the, the, the answer seems to be from the uh, union point of view as a, a layoff protection. Uh, do you have a further question? Uh, no, um, uh, except that I think our other gentleman just showed up. Uh, Mike? Mike? Yes, sir. Mr. Sir. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, some of the things that have been discussed need a little further explanation. Um, one of the th things that was mentioned about patronage while um, the patronage, um, while it's being discussed now, you have to realize that the patronage um, that's in place or the preventative measures that are in place are being judged by an independent um, party like the Massachusetts Civil Service, not the town who has a vested interest in the patronage that potentially could happen. And it's not so much the hiring process as it is the promotions. That's one of the things that has to be protected. Um, getting to the promotions, while Ms. Garvin has stated that the promotions can be negotiated um, if the town were to vote us out of civil service with each union, that's not guaranteed that promotions, people who are promoted while still in civil service don't get taken out of civil service. And when that happens, you're going to have a split department. You have people that were hired under civil service that want to further their career um, so they take a promotional exam and now they're out of civil service. That doesn't unite a department that creates issues amongst peers that could potentially create issues amongst supervisors. Um, and as far as the makeup of the department, we have 49 sworn personnel. That's from Chief McIsaac down to the most junior person. Um, of those 49, we have seven females. Three of those females are in leadership positions. We have gay and lesbian officers. We have Hispanic officers, we have Native American officers, we have Asian, Middle Eastern, we have two members of our department that are first generation Americans. We have spouses of employees that are minorities and children who are minorities. And not to mention, we are one of the most my, my, uh, diverse departments for our population size around, including departments that are out of civil service. Lexington has been thrown out there a number of times from different people here. Lexington has not hired a single minority since leaving civil service. The two black officers that they have were both hired under civil service. And we well, are Lexington, one of the Lexington. most educated departments in the town, or excuse me, in the area. Of the 49 people that we have in the department, only two do not have college degrees. And that is a precondition of hire. We have to have a minimum of an associate's degree within two years of being hired. So we all have education. We all have diverse backgrounds and we want nothing more than to be able to share that knowledge with the people in this town, the citizens, the town meeting members, and that it's important for us. I hope that answers some of the questions that were posed earlier. Uh, so Mike is not Mike, Mike is Casey or Corey. I'm is sorry, right? no. So I'm, I'm the steward for the Belmont Patrolman's Association. The president, Corey Taylor, is with me. He's having audio and uh, 
visual difficulties. Oh, so you are Mike? Yes. yes he's, a, he's a police officer. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jason is next. Uh, Jason, uh, please identify yourself when you're unmuted because I, I don't see your last name here. Jason, you should be unmuted now. Looks like we lost Jason. Uh, Jack Weiss is next. Jack Weiss, Precinct One. Um, two very small points. Um, uh, I, I raised my hand. I, I thought we were going more down more of a rabbit hole in talking about finances earlier. And, and I would suggest that uh, to the extent uh, that we go down that hole, um, that it be balanced by the kind of operational efficiency arguments, which we've gotten into more. Um, uh, so I, just one kind of point of uh, a suggestion that when we get to town meeting, uh, it, this is not, uh, at least from my perspective and what I'm hearing, uh, primarily a financial argument. Um, speaking from the opposite side, to the extent that we do talk about finances and cost savings, um, I would urge people not to just talk about overtime amounts because those overtime amounts need to be offset by the regular salary cost that we would have incurred for or paying the officers or the firefighters had they been hired. So you can't just cite total overtime uh, when you're talking about uh, cost savings. It needs to be offset by the salary cost that you would have incurred, incurred by hiring uh, somebody earlier. And I think it overstates the, the benefits on the financial side of leaving civil service. Thank yeah, you. I agree, Jack. I think it's, it, as you said, it's multifaceted. Um, there's a lot of different financial mechanisms in a budget that get impacted um, with overtime, with um, having to train somebody, having to, you know, wait for a vacancy to open. It, there's multitude of things. We're, we're going to try to get something together for town meeting um, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Okay, uh, thank you, Jack. Uh, Kathy Cohane is next. Hi, it's Kathy Cohane, Precinct 2. I'm wondering, so good discussion. Appreciate everyone uh, coming together on this. I want to understand uh, the role that the union would play. And, and my experience with other town departments are that jobs have a detailed job description there are steps. If we were to make a change to that job description, the union would be involved. There are certain criteria that in terms of experience or skill set that each of those roles have. We can't deviate from that. We don't deviate from that. Um, we, we wouldn't be able to without the union input. So I'm trying to understand how will the unions perform that same protection an oversight on the hiring process for the police and fire that we have with some of the other unions in town. Now, Patrice, is that you or, or Jess or who's, who's best for that? Jess, do you wanna try taking that one? Um, <clears throat> great question, Kathy, thank you. Um, so in terms of new hires coming in, technically somebody is not a member of the union until they're actually a hire. Um, now, if we wanted to make a modification to a job description to say that, let's say um, Mandarin Chinese is a requirement, you know, fluency for that job, then that's something that we would have the discussion with to negotiate. Um, but otherwise, if we're just hiring a, a new patrol officer based on the existing job description, um, we would just go through our, our usual hiring process. Um, and then the union doesn't have any say or involvement until that person becomes a member of the union once they're already hired. 
Um, but, but, but the but the union and staff um, are able to influence the components of that job description to make sure that it's fair and it's the right skill sets. Um, so just to confirm that, and then also, is there a posting process, or would there be, um, you know, absent a civil service? so that it gets posted publicly. I know we do on a state website so that we're not just going to our friends in the parking lot behind, you know, what was foodies to, to solicit candidates. Right. <laughs> I mean, certainly I would, I would speak with the chief to figure out where best to post, but most likely we would post on the Mass Municipal Association if there's various um, police oriented police career website uh, postings, we would place it there. Um, various police associations, uh, professional associations will often run ads at no cost, which is a great way to, to advertise. Um, and Chief, I don't know if you have any other uh, places that you would consider running, but it would definitely be something that would be out there. In fact, just on the MMA site the other day, there was a community that was posting for, I believe it was a police officer position. So clearly that's a, a non-civil service community that, that was out there and, and running a job ad for a police officer, just like they would any other position. So just because to... the intent is to cast a broad net, so. Right. right. So. So we would have defined job descriptions with defined skill sets that union and staff would have input to. It would be posted in a public place that candidates would need to meet those requirements. If they didn't, we couldn't hire them or the union would have a way to intervene to prevent that from happening. Is that, is that am I catching that correctly? I think partially correctly. Um, I know that some of the union contracts, the ones that you're probably thinking of, um, do have various clauses in there about, you know, benefits that are awarded when somebody is comes on as a new hire, um, various requirements and how those requirements can or can't be waived. Um, you know, I know the the one particular contract you're probably referencing, Kathy, is, is kind of unique amongst all of the other contracts in town with some of the things that they have in there. Um, but otherwise, you know, I would probably look at this along the lines of how we handle, you know, hirings for SEIU and some of the other, um, like, AFSCME uh, groups that we hire. Well, and I think just my, my, I wanted to understand that, thank you, but my point is I think while there may be things that we're giving up with civil service, I think the unions are there to protect the employees. And, and I would hope that we could add some provisions in if need be to, to cover any of the concerns that folks have. Okay, thank you, much appreciated. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, next is uh, Alana Auburn. Hi, um, this is Alana Auburn from Precinct 7. Um, I just had a question. Some of the things that were talked about as being limiters on hiring, like the age limits, as I understand it, those are actually set by Belmont. So how can I find out uh, like what the what is being restricted by civil service versus what is being restricted by Belmont that we as town meeting could change? Is that easy to find out? Or is it like just one or two things? Uh Chief McIsaac, do you want to start with that? The, the age limit, uh, as I mentioned before, went in around 2003 through Belmont Town Meeting. So if you wanted to get rid of the age limit, it would have to you go look back. Look at all the participants and look for, you can't? I can't. Um, so that's, um, that's how that would work. Um, you'd have to vote it out at town, you'd have to vote to change a town meeting to get rid of the, the upper age limit. Right, but I guess my question is actually, of the limitations that we see, what is caused by Belmont and what is caused by civil service and how can I find out? Like They're all caused by civil service. Um, you have to be a resident. The, the, I know, yep. but the age is, you said is a town meeting thing, right? So, so no, what else is a town the, meeting the thing? Age is, the age is part of civil service law now because Belmont adopted it. So it's part of civil service law now. If we wanted to get rid of the age thing, we would have to get rid of it at town meeting. Okay, but, okay. So I guess, but the, you know, the two year testing that's from civil service and 
So there's nothing else, like we could do away with the age limit, but there's nothing else that you're feeling restricted by that we could do away with in town meeting without getting rid of civil service. They still give the entrance exam every two years. They give the promotional exams once in October. Um, that's, that's civil service. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Paul Roberts is next. Hey there, everybody. Can can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thanks everybody for participating in this information session. It's been very useful. Um, I you know I've done some reading and some background research on this, and you know what it seems like to me is that the civil service is um, sclerotic and is you know, operating in a way like it has a monopoly on what it does, which of course it does. And, and this is what happens when you have monopolies, which is you stop caring about your customers who are the police and fire departments and, and so on. So I, I really appreciate and can sympathize with the frustration <clears throat> that the fire and police chiefs have. Um, and I'm willing to believe that in the future, <clears throat> there may be an option for the town to come out of civil service. What really concerns me though, is that as a town meeting member, this is really just being foist upon us. Um, as other town meeting members have said, there is just not data to back up the pillars of the argument that the town is making for leaving civil service. We hear, I understand, and, and we hear the, the complaints and the, and the, uh, of the police chief. Um, but by and large, it seems like our board of selectmen and our town administrator are basically taking that whole cloth and presenting it to town meeting and saying, the police chief wants to get rid of civil service, so get rid of civil service. And I just don't think that you're doing your job. I don't think that's due diligence. If you want to come back to us with a detailed plan, a detailed cost breakout, a detailed idea of how you're going to address the very legitimate concerns about patronage and corruption. This is a state that saw three speakers of the House of Representatives at, in Beacon Hill sent to jail in the last decade and a half. There is a long and unfortunate history of political patronage in this state. And nobody, we don't see it in our police and fire departments because not only have none of us been alive long enough to remember before there was civil service, but none of our parents were alive to remember what it was like before the civil service. It's been a hundred years. We are completely unaccustomed to how these types of jobs and these types of hirings were exploited and leveraged by people in power, whether that's a, a select board member, a town administrator, a police chief. I'm not talking about anybody on this call, but as Judy said, five or 10 years down the road, we don't know what we're gonna get. I think if anything we've seen in the last three years, it's that when you have systems that are based on consensus and convention all it takes is one person to come along who doesn't give a crap about convention and doesn't give a crap about consensus and is just out to serve themselves to ruin the entire okay. system. Okay. And well, I really worry about that. I think if you want to bring this to town meeting, do your homework, come back with numbers and a plan and a clear idea of what the system post civil service will look like. And if you don't have the bandwidth to do that, which I really understand, Patrice, then you've bitten off more than you can chew. Do it in two years or three years. Don't do it now. Okay, if you Paul, don't have the time to put together the proposal, don't offer it up now. Okay, Paul, thank you. Let me just repeat what's already been said, which is that the nuts and bolts of a post-civil service uh, system would be negotiated with the unions and it needs town meeting authorization for that to proceed. And uh, I thought- You can't ask us to vote blind on something. You really well, can't. I, and that's what you're asking us to do. It's uh, well, not respectful I don't know that every meeting. Paul, I, Mr. Epstein, that's, that's, not, that's not a correct statement, sir. I'm sorry. You do not need to bring this before the town to remove us from civil service before Mike, negotiating. Mike, you are choosing yeah. to do that. Mike, you're, be, you're, you're invited as a panelist, please. Can, sorry? I just, can I just make a point that uh, while I'm a whole hundred percent behind this, um, this actually ran, I believe this discussion started in the fire department in 2016 about removing the, 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 the departments. I, I've been on town meeting for yeah. almost 15 years. I have never heard this discussed or mentioned. It may have been taking place 
in closed rooms, but as a town meeting member, I was completely taken aback by this proposal. And I think it's something that warrants much greater conversation within town before we're asked to make an up or down vote on it. I okay, really Paul, thank you. We've done your homework. Taken it. Thank you, Paul. I'd like to get to some other speakers before we run out of time this evening, but point taken. Uh, Radia, in, uh, I, sorry, Ian Gar is next. Radha Inga, Precinct 8 town meeting member. In the letter that was circulated by the two chiefs, there's a list of towns that have left civil service. If you look at that more closely, it's actually 29 towns in which the police department has left the civil service and only six towns where the fire department has left the civil service. And of that, those six, only four towns have left both the fire and uh, both the fire department and the police department have left the civil service. Can somebody explain to me why there's such a big discrepancy and what the experience has been for the other towns, why the fire departments are not leaving the civil service? Uh, Rod, I have the same question. And at least part of the answer is that for many of these towns, the fire department had never participated in civil service. It was only the police, but I know. That's, uh, that's not correct. If you. Chief, uh, maybe Chief Haley could have more specifics on the on some of the towns. I, I can't really explain why that is the case, but um, each town has its own difficulties. And I think in this case, um, Chief Frizzell, who was the fire chief for 16 years, had dealt with a lot of issues, um, delays in hiring. And uh, so at one point in, in 2016, it was actually agreed upon by the union. Um, and it's there's a memorandum of agreement that um, was signed by the union April April of 2016 that uh, it says the parties agree to the implementation of a promotional process based on the town of Wellesley's process. It is understood that the union will work with the chief to develop a policy, policy specific to Belmont in the event that the Belmont Fire Department is no longer part of civil service. So Chief Frizzell has been working um, for a long time at this. I can't speak for other fire departments as to why they may or may not have uh, tried to get out of civil service. Wellesley is one of the few towns where both the police and the fire department have left civil service. So I said there are only four towns that I've been able to find where both departments have left. And mm -hmm. that's Wellesley, Franklin, Westwood and Marlborough. For the rest of the list that's included in the letter that was circulated, it's just the police departments that have left. Roy, can I speak on the uh, the MOU? Yeah, but actually, could you answer just factually? Could you answer her question? Is is the Lexington Fire Department covered by civil service now or not? No, no, so they we, never have been, and the police got out. Uh, last year. So. Yeah, so Rana, just to answer your question, if you look at these lists, they show the Lexington Police Department left civil service and they don't mention Lexington, but Lexington is not covered by civil service. So you, I think you can, you can get a misleading picture of who's in and out doing it the way you've done because I made the same mistake. Okay. Can I, um, can I, I just I do want to cover the last two speakers and then we can come back to any points that are left over. Uh, Jason is next. Jason's back. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, yeah, so just please introduce yourself because I only see your first name. Okay, my name is Jason Corsino. I'm a member of the uh, Belmont Fire Executive Board. Um, I apologize, I was having some audio issues. Um, the last time you guys tried to throw it to me. Mm -hmm. um, I've been listening to uh, the conversation tonight and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak. I appreciate the opportunity to hear what some of the uh, concerns are of the town meeting members. Um, and a little bit of my background, I am a uh, Belmontian, born and raised. Um, I was um, a product of the Belmont schools, the education system. A uh, graduate of Belmont High School, and um, I've been a member of the Belmont Fire Department for 16 years now. 
um, in hearing some of the uh, conversation tonight with um, some of the issues with hiring um, qualified candidates um, on the police side, uh, I know that the police chief mentioned that he currently has nine um, potential hires waiting on a list, um, all Belmont residents uh, for three positions. Um, it seems a little bit concerning to think that those nine candidates who grew up in the town of Belmont uh, may not get the opportunity to serve and protect in the town that they reside in or grew up in um, because the town would leave civil service and potentially hire um, someone from outside of the town who really has no loyalty to the town and really has no tie to the town and doesn't understand the makeup of uh, the community that most of us grew up in and most of us uh, or some of us still live in. And, um, you know, the concern with hiring people who may look qualified on paper, who uh, live outside the area is a retention issue. You know, what's preventing these people from getting their foot into the door in a non-civil service department um, with hopes of leaving a couple of years later to ultimately end up on a civil service department so that they can take advantage of the few um, opportunities and few protections that civil service provides like the transparency and um, things like that. Um, so those are things that concern me is how do we retain these people and how do we keep them from leaving? Um, and if they do leave, because ultimately a lot of the people that take these positions um, on fire departments and police departments wanna end up in civil service departments for some of those protections. And when they leave, we constantly will be backfilling those positions at the bottom of our departments. And that's only gonna to add to overtime costs um, like the chiefs hit on earlier. And speaking about the overtime costs, you know, these are numbers that are kind of being skewed a little bit, I think, because they're only taking into it. Well, they're, they're saying that the overall cost of the overtime, 300,000 plus dollars, is due in part to um, vacancies. Well, this doesn't take into account vacation time, sick time, numbers that are injured on duty. Those overtime numbers are also, um, or those um, hours are also being covered by those overall overtime costs. And I think that some of the town meeting members um, also spoke to those points. Um, from a union side, uh, we have an article in the contract, article 16 on the fire side that basically says that prior to retiring within the last year of our service to the town, we notify the chief of the department and we notify the town that we are planning on retiring. We give them a specific date and we do that so that the hiring process can begin. And unfortunately, uh, we've seen this year that a couple of our members have reached out to the town and given specific dates on their retirement. And there has been no attempts made to fill those positions. Um, which, you know, puts the department at a bit of a manpower shortage, and that is concerning as well. Um, so I guess in closing, I just want to kind of echo what a lot of the town meeting members have been saying tonight. I know that a lot of the issues that have been brought up um, have been met with an answer that just says that they can be ironed out, quote unquote, through negotiations with the union. But it is hard to ask town meeting members to vote on something that isn't complete and has a lot of question marks to it. So um, I guess that's really all I have to bring tonight. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak and uh, you can, I guess, mute me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, next is uh, Aaron Pixelingus, who might be our last uh, a participant for the night. Thank you, Roy. This is Aaron Pickelingus, town meeting member from Precinct. Well, we lost Aaron. Uh, am I back? Yeah. Hi, uh, this is Aaron Pickelingus, town meeting member from Precinct 6. Um, my real question is just to understand what the what the basis of the timing for this this is. Why, why are we doing this now? Um, and that is in light of some, I have similar questions to Paul Roberts, which is, uh, it seems like there's information that for me as a town meeting member to vote on, I would like to know more about the alternatives and what's going to happen if we vote to come out of this. It seems like 
where you're hearing about the problems of it, but not what the proposed solutions are. And it reminds me a little bit of when we uh, were asked to vote on leaving or returning, actually undoing our leaving from the Minuteman district, but there was no real evidence that what the alternative might look like, right? And it feels like it's really hard in town meeting to vote on something when we don't have a clear picture of what the two choices are. We're just hearing about one. So I'm wondering if, there's, if you could just explain what the basis of doing this now is. Well, um, from my point of view, I, I think the, the post-civil service environment uh, for operating the department seems better to me. And uh, since it will take a while to uh, negotiate what those terms look like after town meeting approves it, I thought for me, it was advisable to get that process started and also be a signal uh, when the time comes to vote for an override next uh, April, that we have exhausted every possibility to rationalize our town government. Now, nobody is claiming that uh, leaving civil service will cure the town's budget deficit, but it's, it's not negligible either. And I, I thought we had a responsibility to show that we are doing everything uh, before asking the voters for such a large override as we're going to have to do. But I, it's going to be large, but I want it to be no larger than necessary. And I, I thought that process should start now. Uh, uh, Patrice, would you like to add to that? Sure, Roy. Um, I think the, uh, to add on to what you said is this is something that we've been talking about for quite some time. We spoke about it with the union. We've spoken about it with uh, the financial task force. I've spoken about it with the selectmen. It, it is something that um, any, meaning, any meaningful structural change in a town takes time to bake. It takes time to bring out. It takes time to discuss. Um, sometimes the discussion is not as long as the baking time, but I will tell you that this is not something that we just threw at town meeting and decided to discuss. This is something that has been thought about and analyzed. And if, again, if, if, if it was just us, no other town would be doing it. Other towns are looking to remove themselves from civil service because they see the benefits. We see benefits for the town of Belmont. We believe that those benefits are real and impactful, and we are going to bring those benefits to town meeting and hope, hopefully town meeting will see, uh, see what we see. Um, the opportunity for the town to engage in structural change that's not only going to see some cost savings, it will help diversify the department, it will help with hiring, and it will help with promotional, it, it will bring, bring meaningful change to the town of Belmont, and that's all we're asking town meeting to consider. Anything that structural change that is brought to a town is challenging, it is hard, it's change. And, and, and I, don't, I don't expect this to be the first one. I, I expect there to be many more of these because to structurally change a town, which, which I have been asked um, by the select board, by the financial task force to move forward, it's going to be hard and challenging. But I do believe the town of Belmont has the ability, the, the smarts um, and the patience to, to hear us out and to deliberate on whether or not they believe civil service should be removed from the town. And if, if they do, if they agree with, with the assessment and what we've what we could uh, propose to them, then then that's it, and we'll go with the unions, and we'll and we'll bargain, and we'll put protections to make sure it's it suits everybody, not just the town, but also the employees. Um, I can tell you that the team that is here on the panelists, we work hard every day uh, to prove and to serve the the residents of this town, and that's what we're here to do. And that's I think we all agree with that, whether or not we're on the union or we're on management, we all want to do what's best for the town. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up, because there's like a link this time meeting with member precinct six again. For me, I like to understand the picture of what I'm voting for. And uh, right now, as a town member, I don't have a picture. You say there are benefits, both in terms of cost savings and in terms of our ability to hire the people we want to hire. And I would like to know what are the specific mechanisms and expected outcomes tied to that in order to vote for it. Right. And so that's a challenge for me. That's my well, Aaron, uh, we will. Uh, it was useful for us to hear the comments from the public and we will do our best to address them again. The, I, I'm sure this will come up tomorrow night at, at the uh, warrant briefing and then again on town meeting floor. Uh, the, uh, I'll just repeat the, the, um, uh, the, the difficulty of 
trying to say now what the world will look like in detail because it's something that's going to be negotiated between the town and the unions. So the we we can tell you the general intent, but <clears throat> you know specific language such as what will you do in this situation in X, Y, and Z? I, I don't think we're going to be there because that requires discussion with the unions that can only happen later. Um, I would also propose that if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to call my office, um, HR, Jess Porter. We're, we're definitely willing to hear uh, the questions and, and um, help you um, to understand where the, where the town's position is. Uh, so I see... Uh, I see two more hands. It's after nine o'clock, which is generally my witching hour for these things. But I see uh, two more people. Uh, if they're if they're brief, uh, let's hear from Jake McNeely. Hi. Good evening. Thank you for the chance to speak. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, so I am a firefighter and paramedic and a lieutenant for the Belmont Fire Department. I had the unique opportunity to leave a non-civil service department to come to Belmont because it was a civil service department. And that's something that attracted to, uh, me to it. Um, as somebody who designed and developed the paramedic service and is very in tune to the paramedics, I can tell you that Belmont uh, runs one of the best paramedic programs around and people strive uh, to get to a civil service department that runs paramedics like we do. Um, so I think just on the marketing standpoint alone, being in civil service is a very po a positive thing. The secondary, the idea of diversity has come up um, between the police chief brought it up, the town administrator, as well as the select board. And I just like to know the breakdown of the diversity of the other town departments uh, that are not in civil service uh, based upon uh, race, um, sex, et cetera. And that's all I have. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. Okay, thank you, Jake. Uh, we will see if we can get some of that information. Uh, well, I don't have it handy tonight. Um, Brian O'Neill, our last uh, person for the night. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you for uh, taking my request. Uh, I'd just like to introduce myself, Brian O'Neill. I'm on the fire department eight years now, also a Belmontian. 35 years, Oxford Ave, uh, graduated Belmont High School. Um, I just like to begin by saying, I, I, I believe one of the biggest arguments is trying to get the best candidates hired here. And when you say that leaving civil service will get the best candidates hired here, I kind of take offense to that. Uh, I grew up in the town. I wanted to be a firefighter. Uh, so I studied for the civil service test. I passed the civil service test. I went to paramedic school, passed paramedic school, uh, and then was hired by Belmont. So I don't believe that leaving civil service changes any of that. I, I believe the best candidates that want to be firefighters will go about the appropriate process to become firefighters. And I kind of believe taking us out of civil service removes those possible candidates that are just looking for a job that they, they just want to get their foot in the door uh, to go about the best department. So how, if you can answer this quickly for me, how can removing us from civil service prevent not retaining the best candidates opposed to just having candidates come in, join our department for a year or two, study for the civil service exam, take the exam and then join a civil service department down the line where Belmont will then be on the books for hiring the person, putting the person through the academy, and then watching the person walk out the door on Belmont's dime. Uh, if you could just answer that question for me real quick, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you for the time, I appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. I, I would not try to answer that question, but uh, which of our town side panelists feels best equipped to answer that? I will. Brian, you know, I appreciate your service, just like Mel P Mike Pellrein. You guys are great employees. Unfortunately, on the police side, there simply aren't enough of you uh, that are taking the living in the community and taking the exam. That's what it boils down to. Those nine people on that list, they, they all may be very well suited to be uh, police officers in Belmont and might be top candidates, but history has shown and proven that of that nine, when we send out the nine cards, we're probably gonna get three people of that nine to come in and sign the list. It's just the way it works. Uh, from the time they took the test, Maybe they've gotten other careers now. They've gone off on other jobs. Maybe they've watched the news and decided, you know what? 
I don't want people driving down the street, you know, throwing the middle finger at me and shouting a cab at me when I'm in the street. So we just don't have enough people that want to be police officers in Belmont. So, you know, there are candidates like you, like Mike, like Mark Curley, like me 21 years ago, but there just not enough of us anymore to, to have a viable pool to take candidates from to hire. All right. All right. If I may add on to that and just state that Brian is a great employee um, and like me grew up in Belmont and uh, a lot of our excellent firefighters are from Belmont. Um, but, you know, and, and as Jake McNeely said, we do have a great system. Um, however, we've hired a lot of people from out of the area that uh, four have already left us and that we're here for a short time and four have asked to leave. Um, so those people are also valuable employees and we want to keep them. However, um, part of the vetting process, I think, for hiring somebody is, is kind of determining if they're going to stay with you. Now, I know there's no guarantees in that, but I feel that when you're kind of given a, a small group of three people to hire, to choose from, um, that really limits your ability to vet these people out. Um, and that's all we're looking to do is a, a couple of things. As Chief McIsaac said is hire the best people and keep them here. And uh, that will also, the benefit of that is to reduce costs to the community in the, in the vacancy that's created. Thank you, Wayne. And on that note, I would like to thank everybody. At the peak, I think we had 92 participants. So I'm very gratified that there's been that much interest in the community in, in learning about this subject, which as you can see is both complicated and important. Uh, I urge everybody to come tomorrow night to attend the uh, warrant briefing. And then of course, town meeting is on uh, September 21st. So with that, I thank you all again, wish you all good night. And uh, see you soon.